Listen to Science, der Wissenschaftspodcast der Volkswagen Stiftung. I'm going to begin with a poem. It's one of many poems that I'm going to share with you tonight. So I hope you're okay with that. <laughs> Here are my bees. Brazen blurs on paper, besotted buzzwords, dancing their flawless, airy maps. Bean deep, my poet bees, in parts of flowers, in daffodil, thistle, rose, even the golden lotus. So glide, gilded, glad, golden, thus wise, and know of us how your scent pervades my shadowed, busy heart, and honey is art. Well, this poem uh, was penned by uh, Britain's current uh, poet laureate, Carol Ann Duffy. It's simply called Bees, and it's from a collection called The Bees, which I can heartily recommend. The speaker's brazen and besotted bees that exist as blurs on paper might be read on one level as textual creations. Duffy's own poems, this is the first poem in the collection. She is, in a sense, introducing her poems. Here are my bees <laughs> in the poem collected called, called The Bees. Um, or perhaps the bee poems that have inspired her own work. And yet, she speaks here not of bee poets, but of poet bees, insistently referring the reader to a buzzing world beyond the text, a world that is not made exclusively by or for humans, a world of plants and their pollinators, creatures hailed here as gilded, glad, golden and wise, a world with, with which our own all too human world, including our inner life, is entangled, a world whose scent pervades my shadowed, busy heart. I'm going to return to that shadowed human heart later in the talk. Well, this in my reading is an exemplary work of eco-poetics. And here I'm taking my cue from the work of British environmental literary scholar or eco-critic, Jonathan Bate, in his book, The Song of the Earth from 2000. Poetics and poetry derive from the classical word poiesis, meaning making, while the prefix eco, as in both economy and ecology, come from the Greek oikos, meaning the whole household. In its broadest sense, eco-poetics refers to the practices through which we craft our dwelling places, our way of being and becoming with others at a range of scales, from the local through to the global. We might say our practices of environing, as the geographers put it. More narrowly, it refers to the ways in which works of art might embody, imagine, and invite us to reflect upon our relations with one another, with other beings, and our earthly environs. While this is an activity that can be practiced in any medium, here I will be talking specifically about verbal works of art, and more narrowly still, verse, poetry, such as Duffy's. To quote um, Bate, the rhythmic, syntactic, and lin linguistic intensifications of which, in short, its musicality, um, might be heard as answering to nature's own rhythm and echoing of the song of the earth itself. Well, humans are by no means the only beings on this wondrously biodiverse planet that make things. Duffy reminds us of this with her reference to honey as art a luscious substance manufactured, as we now know, by bees, not, as formerly assumed, something heaven-born that they merely collected. Honey is art. Well, perhaps not in the narrow Kantian definition of art um, as purposiveness without purpose, um, which privileges a particular kind of human making. But the art of making honey can be encompassed by the more inclusive understanding of poiesis that I'm using here. 
It is a form of artisanal craftsmanship um, and uh, it, it no doubt also relies upon a degree of aesthetic discernment in the flowers that the bees select um, to sup from and to gather nectar and, ho and honey. This activity is underdetermined. Um, and of course, the honey is not the only things that the bees make. Uh, we might think also of their extraordinary feats of, of apian architecture uh, in those remarkable honeycombs. Duffy's bees could just as readily be described as a work of zoopoetics. Again, this is a new term um, that's being used in a variety of ways. And uh, the, what's generally thought of the first um, time that this was, was written was in a, um, a, a speech originally by the French philosopher Jacques Derrida, where he use it to re uses it to refer to Kafka's animal narratives. He doesn't really elaborate um, on, on what he's meaning by zoopoetics there. But in a kind of wide sense, um, this term is being used to refer to artworks, again, generally literary, that feature animals as having their own agency, interests, and communicative capacity. It can also refer to the poetic creations of animals themselves. Here, Duffy alludes to the way in which bees communicate through the use of dance. This too might be understood as a form of zoopoiesis. It was a Nobel Prize winning German zoologist, Karl von Frisch, who first decoded bee speak in his study of the dance moves deployed by worker bees on returning to the hive to signal the amount, direction, and distance of food sources they'd discovered in their foraging. Similarly, scout bees use dance to make a pitch for potential new nesting sites, and Frisch's student, Martin Lindau, has shown how scouts favoring different sites uh, will enter into debate to try and persuade the rest of the hive as to which is best. Um, and there's a book um, called Honey Bee Democracy, which explores the, the, this process of, um, of bee decision making, involve collecting a collective fact finding and debate. Sometimes there is a disagreement and uh, half the hive fly off with one scout and half with the other, which is generally disastrous. These waggle dancers are not the only signs through which bees communicate with one another and negotiate their environment. Like, my, like most other animals, humans included, although often below the level of consciousness, they respond to scent, not only that of food sources, but also of each other's pheromones and to colour. And although they don't appear to be able to hear sound in air, they do sense vibrations. These are some of the many vehicles of communication which are now being studied within the fast-growing field of biosemiotics, which proceeds from the premise that living nature, as Jesper Hofmeier puts it, is essentially driven by or actually consists of semiosis. And I have here a definition from Klaus um, Emicher, an em eminent biosemiotician, who describes biosemiotics as de dealing with sign processes in nature, including the emergence of semiosis in nature, which may coincide with or anticipate the emergence of living cells, an intriguing idea. The natural history of signs, the horizontal aspect of semiosis in the ontogeny of organisms in plant and animal communication, and in inner sign functions in the immune and ne nervous systems and the semiotics of cognition and language, referring there specifically to human uh, speech. Zoopoetics, in a, a more precise definition given by um, Aaron Moe, who is also here tonight, um, in Animals and the Making of Poetry, concerns the way in which breakthroughs in human semiosis specifically in poetic form, have been enabled by close observation of the poiesis of other beings. You might think here um, of Gaudi's um, beehive architecture, for example, an extraordinary innovation in architecture inspired by the poiesis of bees in the creation of the, of the um, honeycomb. 
Focusing on the study of modern American poetry, Mo homes in on octopi, cats, whales, elephants, and owls. But the cover of his book features an insect. And if there's one insect that has informed human art and literature more than any other, it is, I suspect, the bee. And anciently so. Humans, it seems, have been interacting with bees pretty much as long as we've been around, which is nowhere near as long as the bees themselves. Bees evolved during the Cretaceous period, and the earliest fossil that's been found so far is 100 million years old. They're far more ancient creatures. We're just the new kids on the block by comparison with bees. There are now um, some 25,000 bee species around the world, although sadly a dwindling number as we speak. Bees feature in the, the most ancient surviving rock art. In Europe, uh, for example, in uh, the Mesolithic rock art near um, Valencia. In Africa, there is older rock art that, shows, uh, that seems to show um, honey gathering um, from about 10,000 years ago. The most ancient rock art in the world um, comes from my country, Australia. I shouldn't, well, Arnhem Land is not really my country. Um, but uh, from the continent of Australia, Arnhem Land's right up in the north of Australia. Um, and uh, this is an extraordinary rock shelter. It's really remarkable, actually. Some scholars at, um, at my old university, Monash University, have been re uh, researching this with others, uh, including local indigenous people, to interpret um, this, this rock art. And there are fragments of it from 28,000 years ago. And um, raiding um, bees' nests also feature in Aboriginal art. Uh, it's safe to assume that um, Aboriginal people have been um, uh, taking advantage of apian labour for some 40 or 50,000 years <laughs> on that continent. Some of the earliest surviving written documents also concern human dealings with bees, such as a Sumerian tablet from 3000 BCE, which recommends honey to skin, um, treat skin ulcers. Some of the earliest sacred texts also feature bees. For example, the Indian Rig Veda, a collection of Sanskrit hymns based on our oral tradition from um, 3000 to 2000 BCE, depicts honey harvesting as a religious practice associated with the cults of Vishnu, Indra, and Krishna. Hindu deities said to have been born from nectar and sometimes symbolized by the bee. The, these bees, um, however, are actually on a, a Buddhist um, temple in Bhutan. The ancient Greeks also gave some of their central deities apian relations. Zeus was fed by bees as an infant when his mother hid him in a cave to protect him from his violent father, Kronos, earning him the sobriquet Melissaios, bee man, from the Greek for honeybee, Melissa. Melissa also was the name of a bee nymph, and in some accounts it was she who hid the baby god and fed him honey. Pan and Dionysus were exclusively bee-fed um, as infants, and it was the latter who was said to have taught humans how to keep bees. Dionysus uh, was in fact originally the god not of wine, but of mead, which is believed to be the most ancient alcoholic brew in the world is perhaps as a consequence of Mead's capacity to induce altered states of consciousness that bees became linked with prophecy. Apollo's temple at Delphi was said to have been built of beeswax and attended by bees. Apian mysteries also crossed gender boundaries. The Delphic oracle was of, her course, was of course herself female, and the priestesses of Artemis and Demeter were called Melissae. In this shared denomination, another boundary-crossing quality of the bee becomes apparent, linking earth mothers and virgin huntresses, the domestic and the wild. The earliest written works concerning beekeeping are Hittite texts from 1300 BCE, but other evidence suggests that bees began to be domesticated in Egypt from around 4,500 years ago, a practice that was subsequently most avidly taken up in Europe. 
whose relatively gentle honeybees prove particularly amenable to cohabiting with humans in artificial hives and were thence later transported to all parts of the world that European nations colonized. I once um, heard a very humorous um, Aboriginal um, song um, concerning uh, a chap who'd gone out to, to collect um, honey bag. And um, Australian native bees are stingless. Um, and this guy got a nasty shock, the first of many shocks that uh, colonization would bring. <laughs> Beekeeping and uh, some of its sacred associations found out along with the Roman Empire. But the Celts and Saxons already had their own versions of apian mysteries, revering bees as messengers between worlds. Nor were such associations entirely lost with Christianization. St. Basil of Caesarea in modern-day Turkey, known for his care of the poor and underprivileged and celebrated today for his bio-inclusive theology. He's pretty cool, that old Basil of Caesarea. He was said to have been bee-fed, um, as were at Plato, Pindar, Sophocles, Xenophon, and the Romans Virgil and Lucan. The word of God became referred to as honey in the mouth. With the eloquent St. Ambrose and St. Bernard, patron saints of bees, beekeepers, wax melters, and candle makers, earning the title of Dr. Mellifluous. Of course, this is where we get the English word mellifluous um, in association with honey. Falsely assumed to reproduce asexually, bees became associated with the Virgin Mother of God and beeswax with the spotless flesh of Christ. That's why candles in churches are meant to be of beeswax, because it's pure. In the Middle Ages, bees became an emblem of holiness and innocence. As the only creature to have escaped from the Garden of Eden before the fall, they could see it coming. I thought, I'm out of here. <laughs> right? And uh, so have to survived untainted by the consequences. On the other hand, because they were believed to gestate in rotting matter, including carrion, they were sometimes seen as seriously tainted, as abject. And their selfless labor for the common good was then construed as a means to redeem themselves, a means that fallen humans too ought to emulate. So bees are um, not only boundary crosses, but also figures of ambivalence or ambivalent figures within European cultural tradition. Beekeeping nonetheless became an important part of monastic life, with practical uses of honey and wax integrally interlinked with spiritual values. Because bees retain the capacity to up and leave, never entirely domesticated, the monks and nuns sought their cooperation through prayer in the form of bee blessings. And indeed, one of the oldest surviving texts in Old German, believed to be from the ninth century, is one such bee blessing from the monastery at Losch. And uh, here is the English translation. Christ, the bee swarm, Christ, the bee swarm is out here. Now fly, you my animals, come in the Lord's peace, in God's protection, come home in good health. Sit, sit bees, the command to you from the Holy Mary, you have no voc vacation, don't fly into the woods, neither should you slip away from me, nor escape from me. Sit completely still, do God's will. How convenient that God wills that the bees should sit still for the humans. And yet what I find rather charming about this bee blessing is that it betrays an awareness of the potentially resistant agency of the bees <laughs> that are likely not to sit still and do God's will as interpreted by, um, by the monks. Uh, there's also an old English uh, bee blessing, pre-Christian one, um, which I rather like. Settle down, victory women. Never be wild and fly to the woods. Be as mindful of my welfare as is each man of border and of home. <laughs> victory women, kind of Valkyrie figures, very interesting. Well, monasteries b remain big on bees. In fact, it was the bees bred at Buckfast Abbey in Devon in the early 20th century, which are particularly high producing, disease resistant and gentle that are now distributed worldwide and that are in so much trouble today.
Despite their godly pedigree, until around 1500, bees were generally killed in order to remove the honey, which became a cause of increasing consternation with the growth of ethical concerns about human treatment of animals. For example, in his diary of 1765, James Boswell reported with interest on the non-lethal honey harvesting method of Franciscan monks on Corsica. And in 1830, six years after the founding of the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, one Thomas Nutt founded a movement entitled Never Kill a Bee. Never Kill a Bee. I think we should revive that movement and kind of re reframe it. Never Kill a Bee. Um, well, the modern beehive, which was devised by a reverend Lorenzo L. Langstroth, in 1851, not only presupposed non-lethal honey harvesting, but was also accommodated to the apian preferences and habits that he'd noted. It incorporated a space between the hive wall and the hanging frames of honey-filled combs, which the bees seemed to respect and not to bridge, allowing the frames to be readily re removed from the hive as they were completed by the bees. This masterpiece of multi-species craft, you might say, this particular artificial hive, it was also an instrument of intensified commercial honey production and could thus be seen as the beginnings of the industrialization of apian labor. It was at precisely this ambiguous historical juncture of heightened ethical consideration conjoined with intensifying exploitation that the English romantic writer John Clare penned the bee poems that I want to discuss here. Before I get, with it, get to the poems, though, I think it's important just to sketch the, 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 the history that his verse is coming out of because Claire was tapping into and retailoring a long tradition of European pastoral literature in which bees had figured since the very beginning. For example, in Hesiod, um, whose Theogony of 750 BCE includes one of the earliest ancient Greek texts on beekeeping, um, uh, the uh, Hesiod writes of bees in his work, day, work and days as exemplars of diligent agricultural activity. So this is thought to be a kind of a, an, an very early version of, of pastoral literature. And this trope of bee diligence, together with their dedication to the common good and the well-ordered and apparently harmonious nature of apian society was carried forward by Ger uh, Virgil in his Georgics of 29 BCE, the entire fourth part of which is dedicated to the art of beekeeping. Striking, strikingly, whereas some later bee enthusiasts would extol the apian polity as a model for monarchy, Virgil's bees are emphatically democratic, if predictably patriarchal. Their male leader, as he assumed, can be deposed if he proves unsatisfactory. And while the females stay home and nurse the young, the males supply and protect the hive as industrious workers and valiant soldiers. Well, the Georgics cut their figure against the bucolic mode of pastoral inaugurated by Theocritus in his idylls uh, from the third century BCE. Here, the sophisticated poet um, writing in the cosmopolitan city of Alexandria deployed the fictionalized voice of the herdsman of his native Sicily as a vehicle perhaps of implicit critique of the socio-ecological deficits of urban life. That's at least one way of reading the idylls. In the idylls, bees are part of the retinue of summer in the meadows associated with ease and plenty, but these are wild bees, unlike the uh, domesticated bees of, um, of, of uh, the Georgics. They're also associated with love. Um, in Idyll 9, young Eros gets stung by bees when stealing their honey. And when he runs complaining about this to his, to his mother, Aphrodite wryly observes, What? Art not a match for a bee, and thou so little, and yet able to make wounds so great? 
In the first idyll, the lovesick, goat herd, poet, Daphnis, friend to all wild creatures, is said to have been fed by bees when he was incarcerated by a malicious king. Obviously an echo here of the Zeus story. And here, bees get intimately yoked to the poetic voice, both metaphorically and metonymically. The sweetness to the ear of Daphnis's voice is likened to honey to the lip, while the pipe that he bequeaths to Pan is referred to as a pipe of honey breath, of wax well knit round lips to fit. Well, while the bees of the idols are free living, those of the Georgics are partially domesticated and they're enrolled into Virgil's celebration of rural labor. But what I find intriguing and charming here is that a trace of the bucolic remains in that the art of beekeeping is shown to entail orchestrating a kind of pastoral idyll for the bees as a way of luring them to make themselves at home in the artificial hive. And so we read, let clear springs and moss green pools be near and through the grass a streamlet hurrying runs, some palm tree or the porch extend its shade. I mean, this is just straight from the idylls. Um, he suggests that you, the beekeeper should also make little bridges across the stream for the bees to cross, cast willow branches and big stones enough, bridge after bridge where they may footing find and spread their wide wings to the summer sun. And of course, you should, you should um, plant plants that the bees enjoy. Um, and let green cassius and far-scented times and savory with its heavy laden breath bloom round about and violet beds hard by sip sweetness from the fertilizing springs. So the bees bring a kind of bucolic moment into the hard-working world of the Georgics. Interestingly, bees figure far less significantly in the eclogues which answer more specifically to the idols. And those that do are, of course, wild bees, invoked near the opening in association with restful enjoyment of a rural home place in old age. Um, here, as of old, your neighbour's bordering hedge that feasts with willow flower, the Hibbler bees, shall oft with gentle murmur lull to sleep. Hibbler is a place in Sicily renowned for its honey, so Virgil is nodding here to the Sicilian Theocritus. While simultaneously underscoring his divergence from the idols, this is a vision um, of a possible future rather than a mythic past, and one that might be derailed by the current political turbulence that is spilling out into the countryside. Well, I'm going to fast forward now to um, Britain in the 18th century, by which time this um, complex dyad of Georgic and bucolic modes of pastoral had given way to a stark divide between the idealizations of Augustan pastoral on the one hand and the subversive realism of labouring class anti-pastoral uh, on the other, such as Stephen Duck's The Thresher's <coughs> Labour that talks about the sweat running down the faces of the, of the threshers um, in the fields. The genius of romantic neo or counterpastoral at its best was, I believe, to forge a new synthesis, celebrating the more than hu human life of the countryside in the shadow of industrialization from a standpoint of resistance to encroaching objectification, instrumentalization, and commodification. So now I'm going to turn to Claire, late romantic English writer, himself labouring class um, by background. Claire's Wild Bees carries forward the vision of present pleasure and imminent holiness of Wordsworth's earlier verse, while introducing a whole new attentiveness to the appearance and habits of the poet's other than human fellow creatures. And here are the wild bees. These children of the sun, just indulge me while I read this because I love reading, Claire. These children of the sun which summer brings as pastoral minstrels in her merry train pipe rustic ballads upon busy wings and glad the cotter's quiet toils again. 
The white-nosed bee that bores its little hole in mortared walls and pipes its symphonies, a never-absent cousin black as coal, that Indian-like but paints its little fires with white and red bedight for holiday, right earlily a morn to pipe and play and with their legs stroke slumber from their eyes. And I so fond they of their singing seem that in their holes a bed at close of day they still keep piping in their honey dreams. And larger ones that thrum on ruder pipe round the sweet smelling closen and rich woods where tawny white and red flush clover buds shine bonnily and bean fields blossom ripe to these sweet poets shed dainty perfumes and give honey food to these sweet poets of the summer fields. Me, much delighting as I stroll along the narrow path that hay-laid meadow yields, catching the windings of their wandering song. The black and yellow bumble first on wing to buzz among the sallow's early flowers, hiding its nest in holes from fickle spring who stints his rambles with her frequent showers. And one that may for wiser piper pass in livery dress half sables and half red, who laps a moss ball in the meadow grass and hoards her stores when April showers have fled. And russet commoner, who knows the face of every blossom that the meadow brings, starting the traveller to a quicker pace by threatening round his head in many rings. These sweet and summer, in their happy glee, by giving for her honey melody. Well, I'm just beginning to learn about bees, <laughs> but Jeff Ollerton knows a great deal about them. He is a um, entomologist, and I found on his blog an identification of the bees named in this poem. So let me tell you what Jeff Ollerton reckons these bees are. The white-nosed bee and its never-absent cousin, black as coal, he, he thinks this is the male and female hairy-footed flower bee. The black and yellow bumble first on wing is the buff-tailed bumblebee. The one that may for wiser piper pass in livery dress, half sables and half red, the red-shanked carder bee. These are all bumblebees, by the way. Uh, and the russet commoner, the common carder bee. That's all he could figure out. But still, that's, that's pretty good. And I think it's a testimony to the loving attentiveness to particular creatures that Claire brought to his writing, that such identifications can be made. But equally important is his vision of Fusis as a gift economy, where plants shed dainty perfumes and give honey food to the bees, who in turn pass along the gift that they, as the recipients of botanical bounty, they pass along the gift in their wandering song, much delighting the poet who responds in turn with his work of words that celebrates his apian counterparts hailed in the opening as pastoral minstrels in summer's merry train, who pipe rustic, rustic ballads upon busy wings and glad the cotter's quiet toils again. So there's a kind of a, a continuous kind of cycling of the gift that sustains the diverse life of this place that Claire writes about with such loving attention. Foregrounding his critterly companionship, or his kinship indeed, with these apian others, Claire frames his own work, his own verse, as a work of symbiosis, as a collaborative making with more than human others, inspired and enabled by their summary, by the summary, summary symphonies of wild bees, which are in turn inspired and enabled by floral flourishing. This is a vision of symbiosis that does not de return, demand a return to some putative paradise in which the bee had not yet acquired its sting. Here, as elsewhere, Claire admits conflict and suffering as an inevitable dimension of creaturely existence. In this case, remarking the propensity of the russet commoner who knows the face of every blossom to startle the traveller to a quicker pace by threatening round his head in many rings. And uh, indeed, it's been pointed out to me that the piping, the piping uh, can be a prelude to swarming. And so for any passers-by was potentially a warning um, that the bees were about to get out and about. 
Um, in a later bee poem, a sonnet from the 1830s, however, the moment of threat has become predominant. And as in other poems on animals of this period, it's humans who are the main aggressors. The wild bee nest. The mower tramples on the wild bee's nest and hears the busy noise and stops the rest, who careless proggle out the mossy ball and gather up the honey, comb and all. The boy that seeks dewberries from the sedge and lays the poison berries on the hedge will often find them in the meadow hay and take his bow and drive the bees away. And when the maiden goes to turn the hay, the schoolboy eats the honeycomb and all and often knocks his hat again the wall and progs a stick in every hole he sees to steal the honey bag of black-nosed bees. Well, while the damage named in the opening lines is evidently accidental and possibly regretted, the mower tramples on the wild bee's nest and hears the busy noise and stops the rest. The rest of the poem places greed and fear at the forefront of human relations with bees. That this is not just a matter of subsistence, but of an excessive form of consumption, careless of consequences, is made clear by the repeated description of not simply honey gathering, but of taking the honey comb and all. And while the speaker of the earlier poem simply garners pleasure from the symphonies piped by those bees who avail themselves of the fruits of human labor by nesting in walls, the schoolboy of the sonnet knocks his hat again the wall and progs a strict stick in every hole he sees to steal the honey bag of black-nosed bees. There's possibly also an element of carelessness in the description of the schoolboy who, in gathering a wild harvest of dewberries, comes across poison berries from the nightshade plant, which he lays on the hedge, risking their consumption by other children or animals for whom they're poisonous. At the same time, the reference to poisonous berries resonates with the threat of the bee's defensive sting, which is alluded to in the following lines, describing the boy, uh, schoolboy driving the bees out of the hay with a stick, while the maiden who, turn, who goes to turn the hay whips her apron and runs away. In place of the pleasures of more than human coexistence then, Claire now foregrounds the antagonisms that beset interspecies rural relations. All this, however, is relatively harmless compared with the impacts on bees and the wider socio-ecologies in which we are entangled with them, of that industrialization of the countryside that Claire witnessed with the enclosure of erstwhile common land and the expansion of commercial crop production. The shadowed heart of the speaker of Duffy's Bees could well be read as alluding to the current plight of our apian kin in the era that has been dubbed the Anthropocene, a new geological era provisionally dated to the 1950s when human alterations of the planet became so widespread and so profound that they will likely be evident in the geological record for millennia into the future. Well, while the scientists who first coined this term Kutzen and Stürmer traced its beginnings back to the late 18th century with the development of the, um, the steam engine burning uh, fossil fuel. There was another earlier shift that's particularly pertinent to one of the key indicators of the Anthropocene, namely biodiversity loss associated with changes in land use. Specifically, the devastating transformation of diverse kinds of human-tended farms, pastures and forests into extractive and enclosed plantations, relying on slave labor and other forms of exploited, alienated, and usually spatially transfor transported labor. That last was a quotation from an article by Donna Haraway, published in um, Environmental Humanities in 2016. One of the immediate consequences of this epochal shift in what Haraway and others have called the plantation of scene was that in Britain especially, bees began to be less prized for their honey-making prowess with sugar from slave-worked cane plantations taking over as a sweetener of choice. Itself now replaced, especially in the US, home to those original plantations by corn syrup a byproduct of the mass production of commercial corn, less for di direct human consumption than as a fast fattener for beef cattle. 
Beginning in the 16th century, to go back to the Haraway article again, the plantation of scene continues with ever greater ferocity in globalised factory meat production, monocrop agribusiness and immense substitutions of crops like palm oil for multi-species forests and their products that sustain human and non-human critters alike. Among its victims are bees who've in the meantime been subjected to a whole new regime of industrial exploitation, with honeybees and more recently uh, bumblebees also being bred fit for purpose and transported around the world wherever required to fertilise cash crops. These industrialised bees have become vulnerable to a lethal mix of parasites and pests, pathogens, exposure to pesticides, reduced genetic diversity and poor nutrition, including obscenely having all of their honey taken from the hive and being fed instead on corn syrup. Um, con and all of these things perhaps contributing to um, the particularly horrible and still rather mysterious phenomenon of colony collapse disorder. Meanwhile, many of the free living counterparts of these industrial bees um, have begun to decline dramatically as a consequence of the loss of their favoured food sources as vegetation is converted um, into housing, roads and other human infrastructure together presumably with toxins ingested from flowering crops and the impacts of climate change. For example, one study has shown flower declines of 60% with 40 years of warming in alpine meadows that are largely protected from land use changes. While not all bee species are declining, with some actually increasing their range, the outlook globally is not good, to put it mildly. If the honey dreams of Claire's romantic bees still carried the ancient cultural connotation of the prophetic voice, today's apian messengers have become eco-prophets of a different sort. As Claire Preston, the author of um, a little monograph, reaction monograph on the bee, um, observes mournfully, quote, the substances the bees gather in water, nectar, pollen, and even blood gas are analyzed for ecological changes and health hazards. As animal monitors of these various toxins and dangers, bees are likely to perish in the very act of bringing us the dire tidings of our own terrible technologies. Well, appropriately perhaps, in light of the history of the plantation scene that I've just limned, it was an American poet, Linda Paston, Poet Laureate of Maryland from 1991 to 1995, who already saw the writing on the wall some 20 years ago. The biography of the bee is written in honey and is drawing to a close. Soon the buzzing plain chant of summer will be silenced for good. The flowers unkindled will blaze one last time and go out. I think it's interesting to note uh, the opening stanza um, takes the, the poetic form of the Tetsu Rima, which was made famous by Dante in the Divine Comedy. Um, and there may be um, an allusion here to um, the uh, p part of the Divine Comedy uh, which depicts a bee-like host of angels flanking the rows of paradise. But what happens is that that tetsarima falls apart, it frays into this lo looser four-line um, four verse in the preceding s stanzas. A poetic analogy, perhaps, for the undoing of the patterns of connectivity and interchange that sustain earthly flourishing and in which pollinators, of course, play a key role. This might be seen as a work of eco-poetics in a more narrow, socially critical mode of environmental or environmentalist poetry. And uh, Duffy, in her collection, The Bees, also includes a poem um, with a similar slant. It's called um, um, Ariel, you may remember from uh, Shakespeare's The Tempest, where the bee sucks, there suck I, in a cowslip's bell I lie, becomes now, where the bee sucks, neonicot, 
retinoid insecticides in a cowslip's bell lie. In fields purple with lavender, yellow with rape, and on sunflowers upturned face. On land monotonous with cereals and grain, merrily, merrily, sour in the soil, sheathing the seeds, systemic in the plants and crops, the million acres to be ploughed, seething in the orchards now under the blossom that hangs on the bough. Well, I've learnt in discussion with my colleague here, Susan, who's also been working on bees and poetry, um, that the toxicity of neonicotinoids for bees remains debated. Um, but there is evidence that, um, that this uh, pesticide, this, this toxin, affects their nervous system, causing disorientation and interfering with that um, very... Um, communicative intelligence, um, you know, upon which we too are reliant um, for the food that we eat um, that is pollinated by bees. How ironic that a society that glorifies the human species precisely for our alleged superior smarts, our high intelligence, that we should have placed um, our techno-scientific know-how so thoroughly in thrall to corporate profits that we are stupefying a species upon whose intelligence we ourselves are dependent. Well, having taken note of plummeting bee populations along with declines in other pollinator species, techno-scientific efforts are now being redoubled to manufacture artificial pollinators. An example of the use of biomimicry to replace rather than to sustain living organisms as the principal agents of ecological creativity. Now, this is an artist's model, but it's an artist's model of um, a, a mechanical pollinator that is being developed by scientists at University of Melbourne in Australia. Well, while such artificial pollinators may be necessary in the interim to safeguard human uh, food supplies and uh, food for many other creatures as well, surely it would be more ethical as well as more pleasurable, the odd sting notwithstanding, to pull out all the stoppers and pull bees back from the brink. In a globalised world, we have the opportunity, I would say, even the necessity of cultivating the arts of kin making as a cross and intercultural endeavor. For example, by including the voices of those non-modern and non-Western peoples who retained a fine-grained knowledge of how to get along with bees in particular ways and places. But so too, we might recall the counter-modern perspective of romantic poets like Clare with his sympoietic practice of piping along with bees in their honey dreams. Today, though, this will be a post-pastoral and potentially an urban project with cities becoming redesigned as places of welcome and refuge for more than human others, as ever more people and species are unhoused as a consequence of calamitous environmental and climatic change. Um, these, these are students from the ecology department at the University of Freiburg creating um, <coughs> affordances for bees to come and inhabit the city um, in Freiburg. The fate of bees and of the plants they pollinate, together with so much else on this increasingly anthropogenic planet, is to a greater or lesser extent in our hands. And this is from a still from a really beautiful work of video art called Host. Um, and I think the implication there is that uh, we need to be playing host to the host. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Kate, for a beautiful and thought-provoking talk. And I'm sure there are questions. The floor is open. If people want to ask questions in German, I'm sure that's fine, too. Um, I just wanted to ask you about um, this idea of the bee in relation to society and communication. Because uh, a couple of years ago, there was an English Studies in Canada journal issue that, was, uh, that came out. And uh, Karen Ball and Melissa Haynes 
declared that the bee was a global animal. It was emblematic of a global planetary consciousness. Mm. And so I was wondering if you thought that the bee had a communicative power that extends to the entire planet. Is it indeed an emblem of a planetary demise? Um, well, potentially. Um, I mean, there are a couple of questions there about communication. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, the, the, the problem with um, declining bee populations is um, not entirely universal, um, but it is fairly global. Um, and, you know, were this decline to continue, um, it indeed would be, you know, pretty dreadful. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I think, you know, in their decline as, um, as uh, um, uh, Pre Pre Preston says, um, it, 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 they are in their kind of very corporeality in the toxins that they carry and in their decline, they, they are a kind of um, an embody, embodying kind of a wake up call, if you like, and so embodying kind of prophetic call. Um, yeah, um, thanks. Uh, the, the one place where they're actually doing okay so far is Australia, funny enough, because we have so many <laughs> ecological problems in Australia. It's a real disaster zone on most fronts. <laughs> but the, the bees, the bees are, 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 are seem to be okay um, so far. Frederike. Yeah, thank you, um, Kate, for that lovely talk. Um, I'm, really, I'm still trying to get my head around um, kin making and how this could, could really... I mean, this Freiburg project would be one way to deal with this, um, but what could be, could be others? And I'm still still grappling with that. But my question is, um, for me as a, as a lay woman on, on, on all this, um, on, on bee speaking and, and bee biography, but um, as I just read uh, Lillian Paul's The Bees, and again, what I came, what I thought, what kept me, kept me thinking is um, talking about bees um, always um, connected to talking about wasps as well, and then always having the distinction between the useful, beautiful, art-making <laughs> bee and the nasty little shit <laughs> with a wasp. Um, and I'm still I'm wondering why that yeah. is. Um, yeah. Is that just because it's not a useful um, animal um, for, for human beings? And... Um, do do people need the wasp to to upgrade the bee? I'm I'm just I'm curious what you what you've come across <laughs> in your research on the status yeah. of the wasp. Yeah, that that's very interesting. Um, I I just learned actually I'm reading a gorgeous book at the moment, which is which is over there. It's by an English um, bee um, scientist and entomologist who's uh, she's a specialist in um, in bumblebees, and I just actually learned it's called a sting in the tail, which is T A L E. So there's a sting in the in the story that he's telling about bees there. I actually just learned that um, that bees evolved from a wasp. So wasps and bees have a kind of common ancestor, which was a wasp, which was carnivorous. And um, the bees evolved um, as um, nectar eaters. Um, and um, yes, and you know, uh, I mean, be wasps, I guess there's a kind of um, phenomenological aspect to it, yeah, isn't there, in that wasps do tend to be kind of more aggressive, and a lot of people have experienced this um, uh, to their um, discomfort. Um, um, and uh, bumblebees in particular are sort of especially kind of gentle, and, and these, you know, honeybee, these European honeybees have these kind of more gentle traits, and they were accentuated through the selective breeding in Buckfast Abbey. So, um, uh, I, I, the, the, there, there is another um, very interesting, um, sort of troubling differentiation that's particularly occurred in in the states, and I'm sure that uh, Susan, you know more about this. The the kind of um, the terror of the the African bee, um, and some of the some of the kind of um, <clears throat> representations of of this. Um, 
in you know this this threat, which was it was actually a result of an attempted um, kind of um, selective breeding, wasn't it? That kind of didn't result in what they hoped for, um, which is a lesson in itself, isn't it? Um, <laughs> unintended consequences. Um, but uh, there is a kind of racist. Uh, elements in in some of the kind of cultural constructions of the of the the uh, marauding African bees as opposed to the you know kind of European uh, gentle European honeybees. So these these cultural um, ascriptions, of course, are always in play. Um, it's always a kind of material discursive tangle that we're dealing with. But I hadn't particularly. I mean, look, I have to confess, everybody, by the way, this is really new research for me. I, rec I recklessly volunteered um, to give a paper on something that I wanted to work in, uh, work on. Uh, and so I'm really at the start of this research. But in the, the research that I've done so far, I haven't seen particularly this uh, a kind of, um, a kind of a, an opposing of the, of the bee to the wasp. But I shall now look out for it. Thank you. <laughs> There's a question. Kate, that was fantastic, and dare I say, my mind is abuzz with possibilities <laughs> of, of yes. in fact, even which question to ask you, because I've got a bunch of things going through my head. One thing that isn't a question, but I'm not sure if you're aware of it, I just saw it the other day, is that researchers have just taught um, bumblebees how to pull a string to retrieve some sweetened uh, food, and they're then teaching it to the next line of bumblebees so there's this kind so there's of culture. development of a yeah exactly of a fundamental kind of you know yeah. basic culture but that's not yeah. what I just wanted to mention yeah. that thank you my wow. question was around um, yeah. what I believe is one of the most successful Kickstarter programs that um, has ever been funded which was an Australian one called flow hive uh -huh. and the idea of the flow hive is that it's a tap that you put in the hive mm. and uh -huh. so the honey just pours out yeah I'm wondering about your opinion of that because it seems to me that a lot of what we do with honeybees, and it's primarily honeybees that people are talking about when they talk about bees, yeah. is how to get around the bees' resistance to us stay actually stealing their honey. Yeah, yeah. Well, the interesting thing is, and you know, I might be wrong about this, and I know that there is a vegan uh, opposition to, um, to the theft of honey from bees, um, but it seems that you know for, for a long time, um, th there was a kind of mutual accommodation um, that, in fact, the bees don't need all of the honey that they manufacture. They can spare us some, and they have some advantages. It's a little bit of a win-win situation, particularly if you're a really good beekeeper like Virgil's beekeeper with making his little, making his little kind of bridges across the stream and all this sort of thing. You create, if you create really nice habitat for them and you're kind of looking, at, looking out for them and so on and so forth, it's not altogether bad for them. And so um, a, um, a, a hive that enabled you to siphon off some of the honey, as long as you leave them sufficient, um, it seems it may be less intrusive than kind of pulling out the comb, combs and, and so on. So, um, yeah. By the way, um, if you Google uh, Patricia Adams' host, you can watch this little piece of video art. It was actually produced, I think it was produced for um, the uh, Animals um, Australia, um, uh, the Animal Studies Association uh, conference in... Um, yeah, she certainly presented I don't yeah. think it was produced for that. But, but she presented it there. there. Yeah, you'll find it anyway. Um, it's a really beautiful, meditative um, little video. Sebastian has a question. Okay, um, I wanted to ask because Fr Friederike mentioned the struggle between the wasp and the uh, bee, and uh, I thought about um, the story of Bina Maya, um, in which it's it's, um, it's a novel from around 1900, and I think all Germans in the room um, from Waldemar Bonsels and all Germans in the room and even the others uh, know the, the story. But and I don't. <laughs> the main enemy is is a, is a hornet. A hornet. <laughs> and the, uh -huh. the whole, if yes. you don't know it, um, maybe I it's read it. yeah. really interesting yeah. material for you. Yeah, okay. Because, because it deals with the, with the question of the, of yeah, who is part of the community and who is not yes. part of the community. Yes. And actually, yes. um, Bina Maya is the individual who's, who, who decides to leave the community mm -hmm. and to be an individual and, yeah, 
maybe it would be. And I wanted to ask yeah. if it's famous or if it's even known or read in uh, Australia or in, in the British context. Well, I don't know it. Do any of the English speakers know this narrative? No. no. <laughs> 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 it was on Icelandic TV. <laughs> was it really? But in Iceland? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, thank you very much. I'm going to get the details and, and, and check it out. Yeah. Bildungslücke, yeah? We'll work on it. Yeah, right, absolutely. <laughs> Aaron has a question. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Kate, for a phenomenal um, talk and um, for all the ideas that you've shared with us. And uh, my question has to do with the with the ethical turn and the moral obligation that many more humans are seeing that we need to extend to more than human life. Um, and earlier in the symposium, it's been mentioned that hunger can be a starting point for an ethics. And what's interesting about the bee is that our hunger is dependent upon the bee, but the bee also has you know its own hunger as well. Mm. Um, but the bee, unlike megafauna, it's very difficult to have that face or to, mm. but yet it seems like the bee might be the first microfauna to be able to begin to inspire an ethical turn. Um, and I'm just yeah. curious what you think about how this bee is, um, you know, dramatically causing us to shift from an anthropocentric gaze to more of an ecocentric awareness of how, mm. how fragile um, life is on, on this planet. Yeah, that, that, this, this is indeed, I think, what's happening. And um, I think somebody said um, uh, in, an, in another session um, uh, that with kind of small, kind of non-charismatic creatures, what, what is the way to kind of, um, to engagement? And I think this is a case where knowledge is definitely part of it. Um, However, um, and the author of this this book, the scientist became he became a, an entomologist because just as a little boy living in the country, he was just completely obsessed with bumblebees and fascinated by bumblebees and so on and so forth. But of course, you know, fewer and fewer kids um, a grow up in the countryside, roaming around, uh, mucking about with bees, um, and uh, and b <laughs> there are fewer bees. <laughs> <laughs> to muck about with. So as those experiences are, are, are less readily accessible, um, forms of cultural mediation, you know, again, somebody was saying um, that, um, you know, connecting and caring for the, for the more than human world is cultural achievement, um, actually, um, for, for humans. And uh, so um, so I'm, I'm advocating here, this is actually sort of Going, I think it's going to become a chapter of a book on eco-poetics, which is on going to be focusing on creaturely eco-poetics. Um, and we were just talking about this early, earlier, that I want to understand creatureliness not uh, narrowly in terms of a kind of corporeal connectivity, but actually to understand um, that the creatureliness of the bee includes its communicative intelligence that is on a cont continuum with ours. Um, and um, so I think that knowledge about the waggle dance and so on, I mean, that's amazing. That's just opened bees up to us in a whole kind of new way. And actually, some of the early, early research on, on bees in the 17th century, some of the earliest kind of empirical um, you know, science in the 17th century was also focused on bees. I think some of the first... Um, sort of anatomical kind of drawings um, um, from the scientific revolution were of bees. And um, uh, it was um, the creation of a glass hive that enabled for the, first per for the t first time people to actually see inside the bee, inside the hive without disturbing it was a really kind of major thing. So these ways of actually making visible uh, can, I think, help us to, um, to kind of, you know, connect. Um, um, in interesting, interesting ways. Can I say a nerdy thing? Yes, please. <laughs> Australian stingless honeybees are particularly amenable to living in glass hives. Oh, are they? Okay, so Susan, Susan just said Australian, Australian stingless yes. wild bees are particularly amenable to living in glass hives. How about that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, here's a final question. Okay. okay. It's uh, really short. I, I just wanted to know if you know the novel uh, The Glass Bees by Ernst Jünger. Ah, 
it's yeah. uh, from from 1957, and and he, he pretty much uh, does the, what what you just described. He he starts with uh, the idea of domestication, yeah. which breeds technology, and yeah. in the end breeds this kind of glass beast, this robotic beast. And, yes. Uh, he contrasts that with with the domestication of horses, and also with training exercises of humans on themselves. Yeah. So it's yeah. a science fiction novel where pretty much uh, the whole talk would fit into it. Absolutely, you... thank you, thank you. It's on my it's on my list. I read I read Ernst Jünger's poetry when I was doing gammonistic um, as an undergraduate, but I ha haven't okay. read that. Yeah. Well, on this note, okay. homework for everybody. Yeah, thank you. Note, Gläserne yeah. Bienen by Ernst Jünger and Biene Meyer. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Thanks for all of you for being here, uh, for participating in this discussion. And of course, thanks to you, Kate, for a wonderful talk. Um, um, thank you. Thank you for your questions.